Okay, so welcome everyone. We're go we are going to wait a few, min for few minutes for people to join and we will start uh, a thing at the hour sharply. Okay, uh, I think we should start. People are still joining in. Um, uh, so, uh, for, so welcome everyone to this virtual seminar in economic theory. Uh, today we are happy to have Aislinn Born from University of Pennsylvania, who will present the paper, Misinterpreting Social Outcomes and Informational Campaigns. This is joint work with Daniel Hauser, Hauser who is present today as well. We also have two guest panelists, uh, Kevin Hepp from Caltech and Puya Molovi from Chicago. The format is a 60 minute presentation followed by 15 minute question and answer session. During the talk, please post comments and questions in the Q&A section on Zoom. Daniel will answer clarifying questions in writing and may answer more substantive ones live. Uh, this talk is recorded. Next week is our final seminar before the summer recess. We'll have Marina Halak from Yale giving a presentation, Rank Uncertainty in Organizations. Joint work with Elliot Lipnowski and Daniel Rapaport. Our guest panelist will be Ilya Segal from Stanford. And Aislinn, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about a setting in which individuals are learning from their peers about something relevant for making a decision. So we're gonna look at a setting where agents, for example, wanna learn whether to invest in a certain stock or whether to say study or go to a party before they have a college exam. And the key feature, the key way that agents learn is that there's some um, outcomes which convey information about the payoff relevant state of the world. So for example, whether their friends passed the exam based on whether they studied or whether they went to the party, um, whether their friends were financially successful after investing in a risky stock versus putting their money in a more secure bond, um, is going to convey information about the decision that's relevant for this particular agent. So what's, um, what the key features of the setting we're going to look at today is, first of all, agents are going to have heterogeneous preferences. They're going to differ in how they trade off making decisions from some sort of risky asset or some sort of risky choice with some sort of safe choice. And so in the face of heterogeneity, in order to interpret how agents learn from act outcomes, they're going to need a model of how others make decisions. They're going to see their outcomes, but in order to interpret that outcome, they need to figure out what the underlying unobservable decisions are that led to different outcomes, such as financial success, doing well in school, being successful in school, so on and so forth. Now, in the face of heterogeneous preferences, what's relevant for this model in this particular setting is, first of all, what are other people's preferences? If their preferences are the same as my own, then that's obviously easy. But once there's different types of preferences in the population, then we need to understand or have some sort of model of what these other preferences are. 
And then second of all, we also need to understand how frequent these different types of preferences are in the population. So what the preferences are, as well as how prevalent each type of preference um, is. So based on evidence from the psychology literature, often this model in the face of heterogeneity becomes a lot more difficult for the agent to get exactly right. So in a classic social learning model or a classic model when agents are learning from some sort of um, relevant outcomes or actions of their peers, they, we assume that there's just a single type of agent and therefore it's sort of, it's relatively easy to figure out um, how exactly to extract information from the relevant outcome. But once we're in the space of this heterogeneity, as we can see, the model is a lot more complicated and there's systematic evidence from psychology that agents um, systematically misinterpret um, the decisions of their peers in some way. So we're gonna look at a setting with social misperceptions. And what this means is that an agent's model of how others choose um, actions is potentially incorrect. So maybe they think that their friends have similar preferences to them and therefore they use their own preferences to interpret the outcomes and therefore back out the actions of their friends. Maybe they think that others are quite different from them. They think in some way that they're unique. And so in this case, they potentially think, look, you know, I would make this decision, but other people would make a different decision. You know, there's something unique about me that makes me make this decision. And so the key question we want to look at in this framework is how do these types of social misperceptions impact learning, um, long run learning about the payoff relevant state of the world? So there's going to be two key cases that we look at in the talk today. Uh, the first is what's called pluralistic ignorance um, in the psychology literature. And this is where agents underestimate the similarity between their own preferences and the preferences of others. So when this is relevant is a context dependent question. Um, pluralistic ignorance often arises in settings where someone is, for example, estimating the extent of someone else's social inhibition, how confident someone feels when they're speaking, how embarrassed they feel when they, for example, do something embarrassing. Often people think that, you know, they have this sort of negative trait, such as being embarrassed when they're speaking or feeling really, you know, really judged or perceived by others, but they think that others are less likely to feel this way. They think it's really unique to them that they're sort of really nervous when they're speaking or that they're, for example, feeling really embarrassed about something they did in front of other people. So in this sense, the context um, is relevant if there's pluralistic ignorance, then we're going to show that this is going to impact learning in a particular way. Um, pluralistic ignorance specifically is going to lead to cycles between efficient and inefficient action choices. Whereas the other case we're going to look at today is what's called the false consensus effect. This is essentially the opposite of pluralistic ignorant. Um, it's where agents or individuals overestimate the population prevalence of their own preferences. In other words, they think people are more similar to them than is actually the case. And again, when this arises as context dependent, it often relates to um, people's propensity to choose certain risky behaviors, such as smoking, um, adolescents' perception of peer sexual activity, um, people's enjoyment of certain activities that if I enjoy it, I think more people are also likely to have similar preferences and enjoy it as well. And we're going to show that this type of social misperception impacts uh, learning in a fundamentally different way than the pluralistic ignorance effect. Um, in particular, the false consensus effect can lead to incorrect learning and persistently inefficient action choice, um, outcome choices, out, sorry, action choices, even though there's enough information to learn the state in the absence of any social misperception. And then the second piece of today's talk, once we have a good sense of how the different types of social misperceptions impact learning, is we then take a um, look at a policymaker and say, what if, for example, a public health agency or some other government agency could release information to try and counteract these inefficient choices? So we've seen from the first part of the paper that inefficient choices arise in either context. The way that they arise depends on the context, but in either case, in the long run, agents are making inefficient choices. Now we want to see, well, how should we release information to try and overcome these inefficient choices and restore efficient learning to the setting? So we're going to look at a simple case where the policymaker can release public information about the state or potentially reveal the hidden action choices behind select outcomes. So for example, um, a school could reveal do case studies where they say, look, these students were really successful. Here were their study habits. Or these students were really unsuccessful and here were their study habits. Or they could do something like a public health campaign 
to release information about, say, whether vaccines um, are safe or whether smoking is um, a safe or risky health behavior. And then the question we're going to ask in this context is, what is the optimal duration and targeting of such a public health campaign? And how does this relate to the underlying form of the misspecification? So the two features of the policy we're interested in are, first of all, the duration of it. Um, do we need a long-term intervention? In other words, do we need to release information infinitely often, or will a short-term intervention be effective to steer people back onto the um, correct path? And so we're going to show that the answer to this um, crucially depends on the form of the social misperception. And then the other feature we're interested in is whether um, the policymaker would want to reinforce efficient choices. In other words, when agents are making efficient choices like choosing not to smoke or say, for example, wearing seat belts if that lowers the risk of um, being hurt in a car accident, will we need a public health campaign to reinforce those choices? Or do we need a public health campaign when people are making the inefficient choices, for example, not wearing a seat belt or potentially smoking and not realizing that it's linked to lung cancer and a host of negative health outcomes. And so again, we're gonna show that the targeting, whether we wanna reinforce the efficient choice or correct the inefficient choice is going to depend on the underlying form of the social misperception. All right, so a um, quick literature review. Since I only have an hour, I don't have um, too much time to go into the literature, but um, this paper is going to build on the classic social learning literature started with Bitch and Donny Hirschleifer and Welch and Banerjee. Um, those papers look at a setting in which agents learn from actions. They have private information, and then they learn from actions, and potentially the coarseness of their actions won't reveal all of the information conveyed in their signals, which can lead to inefficient herding. This setting is a little bit different because we're looking at learning from outcomes, um, which are a stochastic function of hidden actions. So here there's no private information, but the actions are going to map into outcomes, which convey information about the state. And so in that sense, it's a little more similar to recent work by Alex Wolitsky, who also looks at a setting in which agents learn from their peers' outcomes. Um, in relation to the model of specification literature, um, this has been a growing literature within economics lately. It looks at um, questions about how do agents learn when they misunderstand or have an incorrect model of key features of their particular setting. Um, so the first paper, one of the first papers in economics looking at this was Nayarko in 1991, looking at a setting in which a monopolist was misspecified about certain features of the demand function. Um, there's been a rich set of papers that look at model the specification in a social learning um, setting more recently related to how agents may misunderstand the correlation in past actions um, and how agents may misunderstand other key features of the environment, as well as a more technical literature within model and specification that looks at questions like what is the equilibrium concept we should be thinking of? Espanda Puzo um, derived the Burke Nash equilibrium concept, which has been the go to equilibrium concept in settings of model and specification. Another more recent work looks at the general convergence properties of um, sort of jet more general um, misspecified learning settings. And so in this paper, we're going to use some of these general results, including work that Daniel and I have in a um, companion paper on social learning from actions to take those um, general convergence results and apply them to this particular setting with social misperceptions. Um, also to highlight, Tristan Gagnon Barch has a paper that looks at um, learning with the, um, learning with social, what would be um, called social misperceptions as well, but his setting is a little different from ours in that it looks at learning when agents have horizontal differentiation in their preferences for a good. Um, there's also a rich literature in psychology on social perception bias. Um, most of these are empirical papers that document the existence of things like the false consensus effect and pluralistic ignorance and try and figure out which context um, which one is relevant in as well as there's an older literature in statistics, starting with Burke in 1966, that looked at uh, learning with model misspecification in a setting in which information just exogenously arrives and an individual is learning about the state. So the key thing about either social learning settings or active learning settings, um, like some of the other model misspecification papers in um, economics, is that the information that arrives endogenously depends on the beliefs of the agent in other words, what action they cho um, choose depends on the history and therefore how they interpret that history. And so it's a little bit trickier to analyze because here we have a process that essentially depends on the whole has past history of outcomes. And we need to look at that in order to analyze the long run behavior of beliefs. Um, okay, so I'll start with the model. Um, 
this point unless there's any questions. Um, so feel free to interrupt if there are. Um, so for this talk, we're going to focus on an environment in which agents are misspecified over others' propensity to choose a gamble versus a safe action. So we're going to look at a simple binary action, um, binary, binary state, binary action, binary outcome environment, um, just to keep the notation simple. Uh, there's an unknown state of the world, omega, which is either low or high. Um, agents have a common prior that the state is high equal to one half, um, so each state is equally likely, ex ante. Um, agents act sequentially. They observe the outcomes of their pre predecessors, so the history HT consists of the past outcome realizations. And then they make a single, each agent makes a single decision between a safe action and a gamble action. So AS denotes the safe action, AG denotes the gamble action. Um, the outcome is realized, the agent either passes or fails, and this outcome is going to, the likelihood of the outcome is going to depend on the action choice. So to keep things simple for the talk, let's assume the agent passes with probability one if she chooses a safe action. So that ensures that she passes, whereas she passes with state-dependent probability Q omega when she chooses the gamble action. So Q omega is less than one, passing is more likely from choosing the safe action than the gamble action. Also importantly, passing is more likely when the gamble action is chosen and the state is H than when the state is L. So QH is greater than QL. Turning to the preference of the specification, let's assume that there's two types of agents, a theta one and theta two. The probability of theta one is denoted by pi. And an agent's type captures both their preferences as well as their model um, of other agents' preferences. So importantly, as I said in the introduction, once we look at a setting with model and specification, we need to figure out um, when agents are interpreting actions, we need a model of how the agents interpret those um, outcomes based on what they think other people's preferences are. And so this is all captured in our types framework right here. Pi hat i denotes type i's subjective distribution over types. Model and specification captures the idea that pi hat i can differ from the true distribution pi. And type i also captures um, this preference term here, which denotes the intensity of the agent's preference for choosing the gamble act. So here we're going to look at a simple form of the payoff. The agent likes to pass. They derive a payoff of 1 from passing. And the agent also enjoys choosing the gamble action. So they derive a payoff. Um, proportional to one when they choose the gamble action. So here we're going to assume that each agent's um, enjoyment of the gamble action depends on their type. Um, in particular, the um, types are going to have different preferences. They're going to enjoy the same payoff from passing, but have different preferences over how much they enjoy choosing the gamble action. And so given the uncertainty over the state, the expected payoff for each agent with respect to the outcome is they earn a payoff of one for sure if they choose the safe action. There they pass for sure, but they don't derive any pleasure from the gamble action. And they derive a payoff um, proportional to the probability of passing in state omega when they choose the gamble action, so Q of omega, as well as their enjoyment parameter for how much they enjoy choosing the gamble action. All right, so. We're going to assume that type 1 is a cautious type. What this means is that type 1 would like to choose the gamble action when the state is high. So remember, the probability of passing is higher in the high state. If the state's high, the probability of passing is high enough for type 1 that um, she's willing to choose the gamble action and also derive some enjoyment from that. Um, whereas in the low state, the probability of passing is too low, and she'd prefer to just stick with the safe action and um, pass for sure, but not have the pleasure of choosing the gamble action. Whereas type two is always willing to take on risk. So type two um, prefers, type two's preference for enjoyment of the gamble action is high enough that even in the low state, type two is willing to choose the gamble action and take on the risk. QL um, plus V2 is greater than one. And so in other words, um, action AG, the gamble action is dominant for type. All right, so within this framework, we can define the social perception bias. Uh, we say pluralistic ignorance occurs when type 1's perception or frequency of type 1 agents is less than pi. Um, so this is defined with respect to type 1's beliefs. 
Um, the false consensus occurs when type 1 overestimates the share of other agents who are also type 1. In other words, pi hat 1 is greater than pi. And lastly, the correctly specified model, of course, corresponds to a correct subjective distribution, or in other words, pi hat 1 is equal to pi. Um, so one thing to point out here is, as we can see from um, this setup here, once we look at a setting with model and specification, in order for type 1 to interpret actions, type 1 needs to have an, try and back out what um, action choices are of each agent. And so it could potentially become a um, very complicated higher order belief process. Um, without going into too many details, this way we specify the type framework here essentially simplifies things to all of these higher order beliefs that we would necessarily potentially need to model are just captured through this subjective distribution. So whatever probability type 1 places on type 2, type 1 believes type 2 has the beliefs of type 2, and so on and so forth. So essentially, we can just use this subjective type distribution to figure out what type 1 thinks type 2 thinks, what type 2 thinks type 1 thinks, what type 1 thinks type 2 thinks type 1 thinks, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, we just need to look at this reduced form type framework to capture what could potentially be a much more difficult um, higher order belief problem. Um, all right, so first we're going to take a look at the individual decision problem. In order to draw inference from the observed outcomes, we need to understand what actions were underlying those outcomes, because as we can see, the probability of passing is going to depend on what the action choice was. And so in order to interpret and back out what that probability of passing was, we need to have some sort of understanding of what action choices each type is making. So first, let's suppose the probability of the high state is P at some point in time. Um, then in this case, type theta 1 receives an expected payoff of 1 from choosing the safe action and passing for sure versus an expected payoff of the expected probability of passing. So PQH plus 1 minus PQL, the expected probability of passing when she believes the state is H with probability P plus her enjoyment term from choosing the gamma action. So given these expected payoffs with respect to the distribution over the state, type 1 is going to be willing to choose the gamble action if her likelihood ratio, her ratio of the probability of state H to state L, is greater than this cutoff here, which is just directly derived from comparing these two payoffs. So this cutoff is going to be the crucial variable for, or the crucial expression for denoting the individual decision problem. We're going to call that lambda bar. And in this case, we can represent the decision of um, type 1 as a cutoff strategy with respect to this likelihood ratio. Um, if the ratio of the state of H to state L is above this cutoff, lambda bar, then type 1 is going to choose action AG, whereas if the ratio is below lambda bar, then um, type 1 is going to choose the safe action. And we saw that the type 2 chooses um, the gamble action for all beliefs. This is the dominant action for her, regardless of the belief. And so A2 of lambda, the optimal action choice for type 2, is just as simply AG, independently of lambda. Um, all right, so now we can use this decision rule for type 1 to figure out how agents are going to learn from um, outcomes. Since type theta 2 is a dominant action, we're going to focus on the learning of type theta 1, given that type theta 2 is just making the same decision across time. And therefore, there's really there's nothing relevant about type 2's learning in terms of um, long run efficiency. So looking at the, um, the problem for type theta 1, we know that if type theta 1's likelihood ratio or belief is below the cutoff, theta 1 is choosing the safe action, whereas theta 2 is choosing the gamble action, because theta 2 always chooses the gamble action. So in this case, the two types are choosing different actions. And therefore, the true probability of a pass, well, if theta 1 is choosing the safe action, um, this type passes with probability 1. The frequency in the population is pi. So the probability of a pass is um, pi from the probability theta 1 passes, plus the probability of theta 2, 1 minus pi, plus the probability that theta 2 passes, um, given that she's choosing the gamble action. So this is dependent on the state. Again, it's q omega. But, and this is where the misspecification comes in, theta 1 believes the probability of a pass is this similar expression to the true probability, but rather than using the true distribution over types pi, theta 1 is using her subjective distribution pi hat 1. And so what this means is that when the types are choosing different actions, the misspecification is going to introduce a wedge between the true probability of a pass 
and the probability that theta one perceives um, a pass arising with. Whereas in contrast, if the likelihood ratio, if pi is greater than, uh, if lambda is greater than lambda bar, so in other words, if the ratio that type one assigns to um, state H versus state L is high enough, then type one is gonna also be willing to choose the gamble action. And so in this case, both types are playing the same action. The agent is still misspecified, but it's not influencing how she interprets the outcome. So in other words, her subjective probability of a pass is equal to the true probability of a pass. Both types are choosing the gamble action. And so this is just equal to the probability of a pass from the gamble action when the state is omega. So in other words, when the types are playing the same action, then in this case with the false consensus effect, the misspecification is not having any impact on how type one um, interprets outcomes. Could I ask a question? Sure. It, it seems the case is, is essentially, right, we're sort of looking at for what values of lambda does the misperception lead to a correct belief about others' actions and does a correct interpretation of the outcome as a signal about the, about the state. Now, suppose your environment were one such that, like the mechanical type, the type was a dominant action were instead dominant on the safe action mm -hmm. instead of the gambling action, then it seems Right, like for low values of lambda, you will have a correct interpretation, mm -hmm. but everyone will be choosing, I guess, the safe action. And I guess it's learning just stops there, sort of. Um, and then on the other side, people will be, right? It, 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 yeah, exactly. But here there's really, the misspecification is sort of what we're fighting in a one, in a one, one way. It's fighting when people, when beliefs are low, but not when beliefs are high because of the dominant gamble action. So if it were reversed and the safe action was dominant for a type, then it would be exactly the opposite. The misspecification, when beliefs were low, essentially people would have a correct interpretation. When beliefs were high, they would have a misspecification. Yeah, I think that's very interesting because, you know, sort of, you know, these biases like pluralistic ignorance and false consensus are sort of, you know, defined really without reference to what else is happening in the rest of the world, right? You're saying, as I embed that in an environment where the other guy might be dogmatic on one thing or another, I get different dynamics. Right? So that it's the interaction yeah, exactly. between that bias yeah. and, and, the, and that ambient aspect of the environment, namely the behavior of the mechanical type, which drives the, the learning. Yeah, dynamics. so it's, as I said, you know, one important thing about, um, you know, thinking about these biases that can go in opposite direction, it's not just like, we're not sort of modeling both to say, look, you know, any, anything can happen in any context. It's really, the, as I said, from psychology, the context, tell, or the context yes. tells us which bias is relevant. And then also the context of the learning environment might tell us, are we more likely to have some types who are really risk averse and just always choose the safe action, in which case, um, you know, when other types of beliefs are also choosing the safe action, such that they choose the safe action, we're in a setting where misspecification doesn't matter, or are we in an environment where some types are just always willing to choose the risky action, in which case in that um, the misspecification won't matter when other types' beliefs are high enough that they're also willing to choose the risky action. So that again would also be context dependent and sort of like what's the what's the baseline action for for these types. Right, right. So I, I guess it might be interesting to see whether the prevalence of these two biases, like false consensus and pluralistic, pluralistic ignorance, correlates with like like what, what type is present in each environment, right? So like, is it in environments where there are people who always take the gambling action, do we tend to see one type versus the other type of bias? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that would be, so I, I always, um, when I teach my specification to my graduate students, I always say that this is really a literature that should stay close to empirical work because once you start looking at a world where you're not just disciplined by say having a correct model and correct beliefs, there's a lot of different directions in which you can start to go. And so it's really, you know, it's important to discipline, sort of discipline the directions that are actually realistic in terms of what do we actually see in terms of people's behavior? Like can we, can we sort of make predictions about what people's models are and how they relate to context so that we know which of these is relevant or, you know, can we, as you said, it would be really interesting to see maybe it's really only in the context, you know, context we're interested in related to risky decisions, people are more likely to have the false consensus effect if um, one type is choosing the gamble action for sure, but people are more likely to have pluralistic ignorance in context where one type is choosing the safe action for sure. So 
Um, you know, that's an empirical question, but I think I agree it would be super interesting to look at. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, all right, so now that we have a model of how to interpret outcomes, so this expression right here, this psi of um, P, given the state and given the current belief, um, is, um, you know, is sort of going to be the crucial, um, the crucial expression for how we interpret the history. Um, of course, I forgot to mention, but the probability of failing is just equal to one minus the probability of passing. So the, essentially the insights for how to interpret the fail action are the same. Um, they're gonna, there's going to be a wedge between the correct and the subjective, subjective and the true model in the case of low enough beliefs, but there's going to be no wedge when the beliefs are high enough for type theta one. Um, all right, so given this subjective model, we can now um, derive how the likelihood ratio or the belief process about the state um, evolves across time. So theta one is going to use its subjective model to learn about the state from the history. Um, in particular, it's going to um, the likelihood ratio for type theta one at time t plus one, uh, which is defined as the ratio between the probability that type assigns to the high state conditional on each t plus one to the probability assigned to the low state conditional on the observed history. Um, the hat denotes this, um, this probability is taken with respect to the subjective model. And this is going to be a Markov process. It's going to be equal to the value of the likelihood ratio at time t times the update from the outcome that was realized at time t. So xt denotes the outcome. It could be pass or fail. And how the agent um, updates that belief is going to, of course, depend on um, what that outcome was, as well as importantly, and this is where the um, endogenous information I mentioned in the introduction comes in, uh, what the agent's current belief about the state is, because this is going to inform whether the agent thinks that the outcome arose from the underlying agents choosing the gamble or the safe action. Um, the process, just because we assumed a flat prior, starts at one and then evolves in this recursive way. Um, so here we can think about, we have this likelihood ratio process. The subjective model determines what the updates are, determines what the new value of this process is after observing an outcome. But the underlying true probability of each outcome, so the psi expression, is going to govern the transition process. In other words, the probability that each outcome arises, and therefore the probability that the likelihood ratio moves to this new um, belief. All right, so if we were in a correctly specified model, the probability, the psi is equal to psi hat, um, agents are correctly interpreting outcomes and therefore correctly forecasting their probabilities. And so conditional on state L, this process is a martingale. Conditional on um, state H, the inverse is going to be a martingale. And so in this case, um, if we had a correctly specified model, it'd sort of be relatively straightforward to back out what would happen um, in the long run. So we know that martingales converge, that immediately rules out beliefs converging to the wrong state, immediately rules out non-convergence. We just need to see whether beliefs converge to the correct state or whether incomplete learning can arise. In other words, learning stops at some interior belief. Um, here, because information is always arriving from the um, theta two type choosing the gamble action, since both outcomes occur with positive probability following the gamble action, we would just really easily, just from this, be able to show that essentially learning is correct using the Martingale convergence theorem. So really the wedge from a technical perspective, the wedge that misspecification brings into this model is that when psi is no longer equal to psi hat, this process is no longer a Martingale. It doesn't even matter if the agent, if, even if the agent is slightly misspecified, that's still gonna break the Martingale condition. And so from a technical perspective, to analyze the long run dynamics of this process, we need to use different techniques from the Martingale convergence. All right, so in order to do that, let's first assign a define a couple asymptotic learning outcomes. Um, I want to better speed up a bit because I only have half an hour left. Um, let's suppose the state is L, then correct learning corresponds to the belief converging to zero. In other words, placing probability one on state L. Um, incorrect learning corresponds to this belief converging to infinity. In other words, this true state is L, but you, the agent comes to think that the um, true state is H almost surely. We also sometimes call this entrenchment because it's not just that beliefs don't converge to state L, they actually become really stuck on the incorrect or entrenched on the incorrect state. Um, and then the third outcome of interest is cyclical learning or fragility. And this is the case where the belief process does not converge. Um, incomplete learning does not arise. I gave intuition for it in a correctly specified case on the previous slide. The outcome, the um, intuition is similar here. 
if both outcomes are occurring with positive probability and revealing information, then it's not possible for beliefs to stop um, moving at an interior value. So our goal is gonna to be to derive the relationship between these three learning outcomes and the agent's subjective model, the agent's social misperception as captured through their belief pi hat one. All right, so um, the key expression in this characterization is going to be um, gamma, this gamma expression right here. Um, what is this? Well, this is the expected change in the log likelihood ratio. So essentially we took the, coming back to this slide, we just take the log of this expression and then the expected change is the difference between uh, lambda t plus one and lambda t. Um, as we said, the updates are determined by the agent's subjective model. So this is the update from a pass, this is the update from a fail, and then it's weighted by the true probability of each outcome. So why do we care about the expected change in the log likelihood ratio? Well, the sign of this expression is gonna play a key role in characterizing asymptotic learning outcomes. And so this relates to the callback leibler divergence um, criteria for burke nash equilibria um, and other, you know, callback leibler divergence is used quite a bit in model misspecification. Essentially, this is giving us a measure of which perceived model is closer to the true model in the true realized state. So in other words, if the state is say L, and this expression is less than zero, that means that in expectation, the log likelihood ratio is decreasing or moving closer to zero, which corresponds to believing the state is L. And this occurs when an agent's model in state L is closer to the agent's model in state H. Whereas if this expression is increasing, it's exactly the opposite. The agent's model in state H is closer to the model in state L, and so the belief moves to the model that's closer given the observed behavior. Now, as I said, in the case of social learning, this expression, the sign of this expression depends on the current belief. It can be different, have a different sign at different points in the belief process. And so in theory, using this to characterize long run learning could depend on looking at this expression across the entire belief space. So we're gonna show our first um, result is gonna show that actually we can really use this expression to simplify things. In particular, we can just look at the sign of this expression at lambda is equal to zero and lambda is equal to infinity. In other words, at certain beliefs and the sign of this expression at those two beliefs will fully characterize what the long run learning outcomes are. All right, so that brings us to our first lemma. Um, in state omega, the likelihood ratio converges to zero with positive probability if and only if the sign of gamma is negative at belief zero. And the likelihood ratio converges to infinity with positive probability if and only if the sign of this expression is positive um, at the belief um, when the agent thinks that the state is h for certain, so at certainty. Um, beliefs converge almost surely if either of these two first conditions hold, and otherwise beliefs almost surely do not converge. So as I mentioned previously, in the correctly specified model from a technical perspective, the Martingale convergence theorem just really easily gives us um, almost sure correct learning. Here we can't use the Martingale convergence theorem, but these, these results um, related to the callback leibler divergence um, are gonna give us a really simple characterization of long run learning outcomes, um, even though we can't look at the Martingale convergence theorem. And so one thing to point out here is that these expressions in the lemma depend on an inequality, whereas the Martingale condition for the correctly specified model is inequality, and so here we can see that even if we move things around a little bit, if we perturb the model and therefore change gamma slightly, it's still gonna preserve the sign of this inequality. So we can um, sort of look at things nearby existing, nearby models in a much easier way using this expression than using a condition that's based on the equality. All right, so this um, lemma here is um, an extension of um, theorem one and um, Daniel and my other companion paper that looks at um, in this paper, we look at learning from actions and we look at a general um, model setting with model misspecification. And so essentially we can apply this result to a setting with learning from outcomes and then also to this particular um, social learning setting where agents have social misperceptions. Was there a question? I have a quick question about the lemma. Okay. Could you have a case where with some probability lambda goes to zero with some positive probability goes to zero with some positive probability goes to infinity or is it can you rule that out? I, I can't see that from the lemma. You mean that it can converge to both with positive probability? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's possible. So this is just saying it converges to zero with positive probability if and only if this is less than zero. Mm -hmm. um, 
as I said, because this expression depends on the current belief, both of yeah. these conditions can be satisfied. Yeah. And so if both of these conditions are satisfied, um, then, so essentially we could have another bullet that says if both of these conditions are satisfied, then um, beliefs converge almost surely and they converge almost surely to, well, essentially we know that from the third point and then clearly beliefs converge almost surely. So either condition is satisfied given that combined with the first two bullets, they have to converge to either outcome with positive probability. So um, it's not- And you have examples where that happens actually. Yeah, so it's gonna happen in this paper. Um, so okay, okay. Both, both conditions can be satisfied and whenever that's the case, so we, it's not an, that's not an empty condition that they can both be satisfied. Yeah. In that case, we can get both learning outcomes. Um, okay. So that's something yes. we would call path dependent learning. If more than one yeah. learning outcome can arise with positive probability, then essentially, the initial sequence of um, outcomes is going to determine the long run learning outcome or the long run learning. And so in that sense, um, you know, you could have two different populations that were acting, that were separated from each other. They could both have exactly the same model, but just because of what early outcomes um, arose, they could converge to different long run beliefs despite having the same models. Um, okay, so to take Thank a look at um, asymptotic learning. Um, let's first suppose that agents' beliefs are close to thinking the state is L. So lambda is approximately zero. Um, in this case, um, type one's choosing the safe action, type two's choosing the risky action. And so here we can um, have this derivation here. We don't need to exactly look at this expression, but sort of the key point is that gamma is actually really easy to derive. Um, and if once we put some structure on the specification like we have here um, in our paper, so gamma is something um, that we can easily derive the expression for and take the sign of, um, in particular um, forms of model and specification. What we're going to do now is use this lemma to derive gamma at the different um, possible beliefs, zero and infinity, and then see how the sign of gamma depends on the agent's subjective model. So we're going to vary pi hat one, do a comparative um, static on how the sign of gamma is changing as we move the agent's model from the false consensus effect to pluralistic ignorance um, through the point of being correctly specified. So when the true state is L, then in this case, um, this expression we can show is decreasing in the agent's subjective model and it's negative at the um, true belief pi. How do we know it's negative? Well, as I mentioned, um, in the correctly specified model, the um, likelihood ratio is a martingale. Um, that means essentially taking the log of that, it's the log function is a concave function. And so if the expected change in the likelihood ratio is zero, that's the martingale condition, the expected change in the log likelihood ratio must be less than zero. So therefore it always must be negative at the correct belief. And then when we can show that it's decreasing in pi hat, we can show that essentially there exists a cutoff such that this expression will be negative for um, high enough beliefs and this expression will be positive for low enough beliefs about the share of type one agents. So here we see that this expression is gonna change signs once and we can just see exactly what that sign is as a function of the agent's subjective model. All right, we can do a similar thing for um, the state being H. Here in this case, um, this expression is positive um, when the state is H, in other words, um, and the belief is zero. So sort of what this is telling us is that in the correctly specified model, um, incorrect learning, your belief converging to L when the state is H is not possible. Um, that's not surprising because we could already just figure that out from the um, Martingale convergence theorem. But this also tells us that if the um, misspecification is high enough, in other words, if pi hat um, one is greater than some cutoff pi bar H, then it's possible that this expression is less than zero which tells us that for high enough belief about the share of type one agents, it's gonna be possible that beliefs converge to state L even though the true state is H. Oops. Um, whereas in the other case, as long as agents' beliefs aren't too high, so in other words, if they're equal to the true model or um, less than the true model, then in this case, um, this expression is going to be positive and so that's ruling out incorrect learning um, in the case that agents' beliefs are low enough. So essentially we can go through each of these cases for the comparative static exercise and derive this, how the sign of this expression changes with respect to the parameter. Um, here, in the case of beliefs being close to state H, we know in state H both types are choosing the gamble action. And so in this case, um, 
even though agents are misspecified about the share of each agent, they're both choosing the same action. And so as we saw, the um, misspecification didn't affect how agents updated their beliefs um, when beliefs are near infinity. So here in this case, the likelihood ratio behaves as in a correctly specified model when beliefs are close to state H. What this means is that there's no incorrect learning in state L. In other words, the sign of this expression is less than zero, preventing incorrect learning in state L. And the sign of this expression is positive in state H, which allows correct learning with positive probability in state H. Um, these come in just directly from our lemma. Um, OK, so taking these together, um, we can see that once we determine how um, gamma depends on agents' beliefs pi hat at the two certain beliefs, we can then use this to see what the long-run learning outcomes are for each, um, each of the cases of social misperception. So first, let's take a look at pluralistic ignorance. This is the case where pi hat one is less than pi. In other words, agents are underestimating how similar other agents are to them. So in this case, when type one is almost certain that the safe action is optimal, when type one's beliefs are close to zero, um, she's gonna think that more agents out there are type two than is actually the case. That means she's gonna be choosing the safe action, but she's gonna think a lot of other agents are choosing the gamble action. So she's gonna overestimate the frequency of the gamble action. More agents are actually choosing the safe action. So the pass rate is gonna be relatively high from the safe action. But this agent is gonna attribute those, that high pass rate to, from safe actions to passes actually stemming from the gamble action. So in other words, if you overestimate the frequency of the gamble action and you see a high pass rate, you're gonna think that it's more likely that the state is high because this high pass rate is indicative of the high state rather than attributing this high pass rate to being indicative of many agents choosing um, the safe action. So on average, she's gonna observe outcomes that are better than expected. Remember, she thinks the state is L, she's close to thinking the state is L, so she thinks the pass rate is low, but she's gonna see, given her model, she's gonna see outcome, um, the realization of outcomes that is more consistent with the state being high. So if the pluralistic ignorance is severe enough, this is gonna push her beliefs away from state L, in other words, away from zero, independent of whether the true state actually is L. Now, if the true state is H, that's good. It's pushing her away from the incorrect state. But if the true state is, in fact, L, this is bad because it's going to prevent her from learning the true state. Um, in contrast, when the agent's almost certain that the gamble action is optimal, again, she accurately predicts all agents choose the gamble action. She correctly interprets outcomes. And so um, this is going to allow correct learning in state H. Her beliefs can continue to move towards believing the state is H, and it's going to prevent incorrect learning in state L. As we saw in this case, gamma would be uh, negative, and it would push her beliefs away from it. So bringing this together gives us our learning outcome characterization for fragility, um, for pluralistic ignorance. Pluralistic ignorance leads to fragility um, in the sense that if agents' pluralistic ignorance is severe enough, if it's below this cutoff pi bar L that we derived um, from the comparative static on the sine of gamma, then learning is almost surely cyclical when the state is L and correct when the state is H. Whereas if the agent's belief is, um, if their pluralistic ignorance isn't too severe, as long as their belief is sufficiently close to pi, then learning is almost surely correct. So this tells us essentially if agents are choosing the safe action, they observe fewer than expected failures and start to gamble. That's why learning is cyclical when the state is L. They can't converge to um, state L. However, they also can't converge to state H because we know their model is correct near state H. So the true state is L. Their beliefs are going to be pushed away from state H when they come near it. And therefore, they're going to cycle back and forth between thinking the state L is more likely and thinking state H is more likely, leading to a cycle between um, both the efficient and the inefficient action choice. Um, whereas in contrast, when agents are taking the gamble action, the world looks as expected. So that's why, as I said, they can't converge to state H when the true state is actually L. Um, another thing to point out here is that the cutoff we derived for the sine of gamma um, is lower than pi. And so what this tells us is that the correctly specified model is robust and that a little bit of pluralistic ignorance, so pi hat one sufficiently close to pi, is not going to interfere with correct work. So it's only when pl pluralistic ignorance is sufficiently severe that we're going to have to worry about these inefficient action choices. Um, all right, in contrast, when we look at the false consensus effect, so this is the case where agents think that their preferences are, others' preferences are more similar to theirs than is actually the case. Now, essentially, we're going to have the opposite problem. So when type 
um, theta one is almost certain that the state action is optimal, in other words, when she um, believes state L is um, very likely, she's going to think that um, others are like her and are also choosing the safe action. So this is gonna cause her to underestimate the frequency of the gamble action. In actuality, quite a few agents, all the type two agents are choosing the gamble action, but she's underestimating how many of them there are, and therefore she's underestimating how many people are choosing it. And so from this gamble action, um, there's gonna be some failures, even in the high state, there will be some failures. And so because this agent is thinking there's a small share of agents using the gamble actions, she's gonna observe a higher than anticipated failure rate. So this is gonna cause her to attribute that to the state being low, rather than a large number of agents choosing the gamble action and the state being high. Um, so essentially, if she's close to thinking the state is low, this is gonna reinforce her belief that the state is low and therefore reinforce choosing the safe action. Um, therefore, if false consensus is severe enough, then this is going to move belief towards state L independent of the true state. Now, if the true state is L, that's good. That allows correct learning in the true state. But if the true state is H, that's bad. It's going to allow incorrect learning. We really would be wanting um, type 1's beliefs to be pushed away from state L when state H is the correct state. And then as before, the intuition for the um, beliefs near infinity is the same. They accurately predict, have an accurate model and therefore correctly interpret outcomes. Right, so that brings us together to our um, characterization for the false consensus effect. The false consensus leads to entrenchment. Um, an agent's false consensus effect is sufficiently strong. If it's above this cutoff that we derived in the um, comparative static on the sine of gamma, then both correct and incorrect learning occur with positive probability in the high state whereas learning is almost surely correct in the low state. So in other words, when type theta one agents are taking the safe action, they're observing a higher failure rate than expected. This reinforces the safe action regardless of the state, which allows correct learning if indeed the state is L, but also allows incorrect learning if the state is H. Um, whereas when the agents are taking the gamble action, the world looks as expected. So that essentially that allows correct learning in um, state H and prevents incorrect learning converging the, the um, believing the state is H when the state is in fact L. Um, as before, this cutoff is strictly greater than the um, correctly specified model pi. And so again, we have a little bit of leeway. Um, as long as the agent's false consensus effect is not sufficiently severe, learning is almost surely correct. They can be a little bit misspecified and still um, sort of interpret outcomes close enough to correctly that they, um, it doesn't interfere with how they learn. Um, so now here, essentially, we again have inefficient action choices, um, but here we have a different pattern of long run action choices. With some probability, they'll be efficient, and in the long run, learning is correct, and with some probability, um, every agent will be choosing, or every type one agent will be choosing the inefficient action um, in the long run. I think we have about nine minutes. Um, okay, cool. So um, just to point out here, related to Puya's question, here is a case where both correct and incorrect learning occur with positive probability, and so with the false consensus effect, we potentially, um, we have path dependent learning where different populations could observe the same, um, sort of have the same model of the world and the same understanding, and yet converge to different beliefs just based on the pattern of outcomes they actually observed. Um, okay, so I'll take about five minutes to go through the information campaign's results. Um, I'll just go at a bit of a higher level since I don't have a lot of time, and then I'll wrap up so that we have time for a discussion. Um, so now that we see that inefficient choices arise in either case, um, let's suppose that an information planner can release a public signal about the state in each period. In particular, they can choose some precision for that signal, rho t, um, between one half and one, um, of some binary public signal, L or H, where this precision captures the probability that the signal matches the state. Um, releasing information is costly. The cost of releasing a signal of precision rho is going to be increasing in rho, and convex. Um, the uninformative signal, so one half is an uninformative signal, it's just equally likely in either state, um, that's going to cost zero. And as the precision becomes arbitrarily precise, the um, marginal cost is going to converge to infinity. All right, so a feasible policy is going to be measurable with respect to the filtration generated by the outcome and public signal process. Uh, we're going to assume the planner has a correctly specified model. Agents anticipate the planner's model, but believe the planner is misspecified.
Um, all right, so now if agents learn from both the outcomes and the public signal, we can also look at the likelihood ratio process. It's the same as before, except now we add a component um, for how the agent updates from a public signal, depending on whether they observe a high or a low signal. And this can potentially counteract the misspecification about the outcome. All right, so our objective is going to be for the planner to select the cheapest policy to restore the asymptotic rate of learning in the correctly specified model. And um, sort of our motivation for looking at this objective is that we want to see, you know, if there was no misspecification, we know there'd be sufficient information to learn the state. And so as a comparison point, we want to see what's sort of the, the cheapest or the, the best way to get back to the setting where there was no misspecification. So how can we get there? How can we prevent incorrect learning and make sure, or um, encyclical learning, and how can we do so so that agents are learning at the same rate that they would have if they didn't have this misspecification? Um, all right, so as I said in the introduction, we're interested in a couple of key features of the information policy. Um, duration, so whether we need a temporary or permanent policy. Um, a temporary policy corresponds to an informative signal being released finitely often, almost surely. Um, a permanent policy corresponds to an informative signal being released infinitely often, almost surely. So essentially whether the um, campaigner, information campaigner can just step in and release some information and then at that point, um, agents will be back to um, learning as they would have in the correctly specified model or do they need to step in in a more permanent way. Um, and then also corrective um, or reinforcing depending on whether um, how information is released related to the current value of beliefs. Um, do they release information when the agent's choosing the inefficient action or do they release information when the agent's choosing the efficient action or also potentially both. So, these are obviously um, either one or the other occurs. Here we can have a policy that's both corrective and reinforcing, um, or just one. A policy is uninformative. In other words, there's no intervention. If the um, precision of the signal is just uninformative, it's one half for all t, and otherwise it is informative. Um, all right, so in the case of pluralistic ignorance, um, we saw that the issue was that beliefs are fragile in the low state. So when the safe action is optimal, beliefs are going to be fragile. So essentially, here we need to release information to reinforce the efficient action. If beliefs are close to zero, the agent's going to be prevented from correct learning in expectation. And so in that case, we want to release information to reinforce the efficient action. If we ever stop doing so, if we end the intervention, then beliefs that again begin to drift away. And so therefore, the effective policy must be permanent. So in the case of pluralistic ignorance, um, in state L, every optimal policy is reinforcing and permanent. Um, it's caught, and then we can do some comparative statics on the cost. Its cost is decreasing in the extent of the pluralistic ignorance and increasing in the share of type 1 agents. Um, whereas when the state is H, there exists an optimal policy that's uninformative. And this is because in this case, um, we see that the agent um, could just learn the correct state um, on her. Whereas in contrast, um, the false consensus effect, the learning outcome we have to worry about is entrenchment. Um, in other words, when the state is high, but agents come to think that the state is low. And so in this case, um, when the beliefs are close to zero, thinking the state is L, but the true state is H, then we need to prevent this incorrect learning by releasing information to correct this inefficient action choice. So choosing the safe action when in fact the gamble action is the optimal action. Once agents are choosing the efficient action, we know that on their own, they can converge to learning the correct state. And so once they're choosing the efficient action, no further intervention is necessary. That means that the optimal policy is temporary. You can intervene to correct inefficient choices, get agents back on a path to having their beliefs close to correct, but the state is H, and then stop the intervention and just let agents continue to learn on their own from outcomes. So in the case of the false consensus effects, um, when the state is H and agents' beliefs are, the false consensus effects is sufficiently severe, every optimal policy is corrective and temporary. Otherwise, there exists an optimal policy that's uninformative, um, whereas in the L state, there's an optimal policy that is uninformative, because here, we just, we don't have to worry about uh, incorrect learning. Okay, so I think I'm just about out of time. Um, here we just, we started with a simple informational intervention where the social planner was releasing public signals. Um, we could also imagine that, you know, here the reason the specification is impacting learning is because agents can observe outcomes but not the underlying action choices. And so maybe an information planner, instead of releasing public information, like a, say a research study, 
could rather, after observing outcomes, reveal the underlying action for some cause. So in other words, if we see a student passing and doing really well in school, or a um, person sort of not doing very well from using drugs, we could, um, we could sort of reveal their underlying action choices and say, you know, look, this student, here's the, here are their study habits, here's what they did, let's do a case study about an inspirational story about how this student studied really hard. Um, on the flip side, we could have a cautionary tale where we say, look, this person failed, here's the underlying actions that led to that failure. This is a cautionary tale to warn you about how actions map into outcomes. And so from this perspective, we can sort of use the same tools that we've developed um, to look at the, um, the optimal policies related to um, inspirational stories or cautionary tales. Uh, the results from this case over here about um, temporary versus long-term policies and corrective versus um, reinforcing would be similar to the case of public information. You, you know, you sort of, in the same case that you'd want a long-term policy for public information, you'd also want a long-term policy for um, revealing actions. But then we can also ask the question of what should you do? Should you tell inspirational stories, cautionary tales? Should you do both? Um, this is something we're actively working on right now. We can um, sort of show whether you'd rather reveal actions after failure or success and how that depends on the underlying parameters of the model. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this, but um, you know, we're hoping we can have some nice, re re nice insights relating to properties of the model to which of these two you'd rather do. Um, all right, so in the last minute, I'll take a second to conclude. Um, as we showed in this paper, misspecification can lead to belief cycles and incorrect learning. Um, that's already an insight that we know pretty well from the um, model and specification literature and social learning. Here we show that these inefficient choices are possible to offset with an information campaign. Um, the features of the optimal policy are going to depend on the form of the specification, whether we want to intervene infinitely often or whether we want to just do a temporary intervention. And then the structure of um, when, when we intervene in terms of what action choices um, trigger an intervention. And um, here we want to, how we balance these forces and really depend on the underlying form of the misspecification. Um, so as I said, this is a um, project we're actively working on. We'd love to hear comments. Um, a couple of things we're thinking about going forward is looking at um, the discounted case. Um, so looking at a slightly different objective for the social planner where they want to um, say maximize some discounted um, sum of agents payoffs. And then we can look at things like the cost of delay Potentially, it's more costly to delay when we're worried about entrenchment than when we're worried about fragility. Um, and then also looking at things, public versus private information. Uh, we looked at public signals, but maybe it would be better to release private signals to agents um, in order to help them learn rather than a public signal. So we can also look at um, questions like that. Um, all right, so thank you very much. And at this point, I'm done with um, what I had to say. So happy to open up the floor to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, excellent talk. You, you did cover a lot of <laughs> a lot of material, but you are right uh, on time. Um, so the way we are going to proceed is uh, this is a Q and A session. We are going to give floor to our panelists to have uh, maybe give us some last comments or, or, or questions or, or indeed dis discuss um, a few issues. Um, to the audience attendees, uh, if you have any questions, let us know. We are going to unmute you and uh, we can have a conversation. Um, I have also some questions. So uh, Kevin or Puya, who, who wants to go first? Um, I have a um, pointer to working papers on one hand and then like some suggestion for future work on the other hand, but it's not super related to talk. Someone has something that's more immediately related, they should probably go first. Mm -hmm. I have a question about uh, the parts of the model. Uh, I can ask that then, Kevin, then you can, you can go ahead after it. Uh, so do, your assumption is that you have dog, uh, the agents have uh, dogmatic beliefs when it comes to pi. They have this pi hat and it's a point belief. They, they think it's exactly pi hat. Uh, have you thought about what would happen if they uh, think that maybe there's some some, uh, so they, they have a prior, they have a full support prior that uh, uh, allows for the possibility that pi is the true uh, proportion of agents. In that case, you would be learning about two things, both the state and the fraction of the agents. So in general, the um, key assumption that divides model and specification from model uncertainty is whether mm -hmm. the um, true parameter is in the support. 
of the um, set of parameters that are entertained. So we look at a really simple case where the agent just has entertains one value of pi, pi hat, um, and they're wrong. We could imagine the agent also, say, entertaining a set of values uh, for the share of types and then jointly learning about the two. If pi is in that set, then we'll be in a setting with model uncertainty. If pi is not in that set, we'll be in a setting with model and specification. Um, and sort of the key thing that arises when we're looking at model uncertainty, so let's suppose pi is in that set, then in that case, um, potentially have an identification problem because you're learning about, as you said, you're learning about two parameters. You're learning about the share of type 1 agents, and you're also learning about the state. And it may be that one share of type 1 agents and state L is statistically indistinguishable from another share of type 1 agents and state um, H. In that case, you have an identification problem. Um, and otherwise, if that's not the case, then essentially you would eventually learn the true value of both parameters if there wasn't um, two values of pi that could pair with each state to give statistically indistinguishable, um, statistically indistinguishable patterns. And so, um, but it's sort of more from a, so that's, that's the technical thing, is, that's the technical answer, is that model uncertainty can lead to incomplete learning because of this identification problem. It can't lead to incorrect learning or cyclical learning because once we have model uncertainty, beliefs are again a martingale. And so in that case, we can't have convergence to the incorrect state or um, non-convergence. Um, if, of course, you could entertain a set of values for pi hat and not have the true pi in the support, then you know, things could just collapse. You could have similar results where you'd learn some value, long run value of pi hat as well as um, some state, which could, you know, again, it could be incorrect or we could have cyclical learning. That would just depend on certain features of what the support of beliefs, uh, what the support of share of pi one types, um, type one entertained. Um, but sort of more conceptually, if we take a step back, um, why, do we, why do we think about, why do we care about model and specification? When we think about how agents are learning about their environment, they're learning about this payoff relevant state omega, which is relevant for their decision. Um, they have a model which they need to interpret it. To be correctly specified on that model requires a rich understanding of a lot of different features of the environment. Um, every time an agent makes a decision, if they had model uncertainty, they should have a joint belief over every feature of the environment. They should update that joint belief and then parse out their marginal belief on the state to make their decision, since that's what's payoff relevant. But in actuality, that would be really complicated. So it'd be like every time you read the newspaper, you'd have to jointly update about the probability the news is slanted in one direction and the probability this particular editor is biased and the probability that the writer was biased and the probability that the statistics are accurate and all that sort of things. And so conceptually, um, I think model and specification is really a stark reduced form for a setting where agents' models are stickier than their um, how they learn about some sort of payoff relevant state. So omega directly enters their payoff function. That's what they're trying to learn about. Of course, it helps to learn about features of your environment in order to interpret information about what you care about. But in reality, if you're constantly trying to learn about everything in our environment to interpret something relevant for a decision, things would get really complicated really quickly. It's a really difficult, um, complex problem. And so in that sense, um, people's models are stickier than their, how they learn about the state. And so we can think of model and the specification as a reduced form where people are just taking their models as given and using it to learn about the state. Um, of course, it's an important question where these models come from and when do they switch. They would switch sometimes if you constantly read newspaper articles that are very, very, very biased and you initially thought the paper wasn't biased, presumably eventually you'd switch your model. But maybe each time you read an article, you're not you know, moving your model a little bit, you just get to a point where you switch. So there's a couple new, very new works in progress that are trying to look at these um, types of questions. Um, for example, one of my graduate students is working on it. But, um, you know, it's so I sort of conceptually, I think of this model, the specification as a reduced form for simplifying a complex world. So you just are learning about the variable that's payoff relevant at hand. Um. So I could, um, so yes, I Kevin, go ahead. All right. So sort of a, I guess, a question and a comment here. So like, you, you know, you motivate this talk by, you know, sort of want to understand implications of these social mis misperceptions understood as like people misunderstanding how others choose their actions. I guess sort of the question is, you know, also, so in, in this talk, you looked at, you know, two particular forms of such social misperception. I guess the question is sort of, are you interested in, you know, general, Theories of such social misperceptions when people learn from outcomes. 
Um, so we are interested in um, more general settings than what we considered in the talk. So for example, you mentioned what if the um, type that you either, what if the type that's different from you is, um, say, more likely to just be really risk averse in choosing the safe action versus the risky action. So in that sense, we are interested in um, some of the ways we can conceptualize this, but we're not interested in sort of an arbitrary setting where agents are misspecified over the type space because we view that more as the, um, our companion paper is looking at sort of a very general social learning setting to derive um, conditions for long run convergence and long run outcomes. And then the reason those conditions are useful and interesting is to take them to more applied settings like this one in order to examine particular forms of misspecification and see how they impact learning. Right, right. And, the, and the common, I guess, sort of point of the literature was sort of like, I don't think there's another class of social misperceptions that like Matthew Raven is an and interest in that book that, and, and some of that also lead to like the cycling and the mislearning result as you have mm -hmm. here, right? So, so I don't know if you know, know about those papers. So like they have one paper that's about learning from actions and there's a later project um, which is about learning from outcomes. And in those, in both these cases, they have like, you know, they get the cycling and mislearning result, but it's sort of different in two ways. So one, they look at like a large generation model. And so like there's a very there's a large group of people moving every period. And so their notion of cycling is quite extreme. So like, you know, you end up with full confident belief in one state and then you move to full confidence belief in other states, whereas yours just sort of non-convergence. Like, yeah. To, um, and then sort of, What's the other point? Oh, right, and, and so, right, right. Your setting being that people moving one at a time leads to a lot more technically challenging, you know, obstacles because, you know, we sort of have to deal with this sort of, um, this lambda process. Mm -hmm. I guess the other, other suggestion for future work I was reminded of was sort of like, um, okay, so, in the end, when I talk about the information campaign, it, it, it struck me that maybe one way of, one, one sort of social misperception is misunderstanding how others interpret information. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of work about errors in social processing. Mm -hmm. And it seems reasonable that we misunderstand how others process information. And mm -hmm. in such an environment, there could be something interesting to be said about how you should release information in such an environment. Um, yeah, so I think that's um, super interesting. So in our, um, in our learning from actions paper, we have sort of just like a simple um, stylized exa illustrative example that shows what if people, um, what if one set of agents um, have a bias over how they interpret information? In that case, <clears throat> excuse me, there's private signals. And so agents are systematically misinterpreting private signals. And um, of course, again, once we have any setting where there's heterogeneity, be it heterogeneity and preferences like this paper, um, in this example, be it heterogeneity and how agents interpret information, to be correctly specified, you need to fully understand that heterogeneity. And so even if I have a correctly specified signal process, I also need to understand exactly how the other type is biased. So what is their misspecified process? And um, how frequent are those types in the population in order to be correctly specified? And so there we look at a case where um, it's sort of an extreme false consensus effect in the sense that one type is misspecified about signals, um, one type is not, but both types just think everyone else interprets signals the same way they do, they don't understand. Um, and so we should sort of the key takeaway from that example is that when one type is misinterpreting signals, the type that has a correct model of the signal distribution has exactly the same severe um, implications for long run learning as the type who's misspecified, even though that type is correctly interpreting signals, essentially, and it's just coming through the channel that they're misinterpreting others' actions now because um, they don't account for the other people incorrectly interpreting signals. Um, so in that sense, I think, um, as you mentioned, um, you could also essentially have the same set of pluralistic ignorance or false consensus effect on how people interpret information rather than um, how people interpret other people's prefer or what other people's preferences are. And I think that's also a super interesting set of um, biases to look at. Um, you know, we don't in the current paper, but I think, um, you know, that and then also looking at, um, again, the um, information campaigns question for that type of setting would also would also be important. Um, okay, uh, we have another question from Puya. Please go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, I have, uh, this is more of a kind of anecdote uh, slash comment. So one thing uh, I think uh, that's a robust finding is that uh, college students, they always uh, misperceive other people as drinking a lot more than they actually do. And so one of the most effective interventions that people do in colleges is just to reveal uh, like the frequency of drinking uh, by uh, other college students. So, so there are these campaigns that like say a typical student drinks this often and has this many drinks. So it, it, in the context of your model, uh, an intervention like that would be just revealing kind of the share of uh, people who have taken a particular action or maybe maybe even revealing the true pie. But uh, I understand that's not gonna do anything here because people have dogmatic beliefs. But uh, if you just tell people uh, the fraction of people who've taken a particular action, um, mm -hmm. do you have a sense of how that would change the outcomes? Yeah, so I think, I mean, the way I would think about augmenting this framework to capture that would be, um, you know, as I said, sort of conceptually, when we think about people's models as being sticky, um, you know, we need to model, um, we need to model how people would update their models. And so at least the papers I've seen that have tried to do that have used some sort of switching rule where essentially once the pattern of data generated by your model becomes unlikely enough, crosses some threshold, you essentially use switch models. So it's not based on updating, it's more like a switching process. Um, so we could try and incorporate it with that. Or I think, um, you know, another way that sort of tractically we could do this sort of thing if we wanted to look at information campaigns is, um, Let's just suppose agents have a model, let's even say full support prior over pi hat, um, over pi, but they um, just behave as if um, they essentially take their expected pi and then um, use that to make decisions when they're getting information about the state. But maybe they could yeah. still, when they get information that's directly about their model, maybe they learn about their model, whereas when they get information that's directly about the state, they learn about the state. And so in that sense, we could think of, um, you know, probably it's not, possible to perfectly reveal a pie, but we could think about the information campaigners revealing signals of pie. You know, like in this sample of 100 college students, um, this many went out drinking, um, which is, you know, that, that example is like one of the nice sort of classic examples of pluralistic ignorance. Um, and so we could see in that case, um, how would you have to release information about the type distribution? What, like, what sorts of patterns of information release would we see in order to, I guess you'd want to get agents' models close enough to correct. And in that case, yeah. we know that once their model's close enough to correct, then the intervention can stop and we can just um, let people learn on their own. Um, yeah. So definitely, I think, you know, sort of that may be more feasible in some contexts than others as a type of intervention, but it's um, for sure an important one. And, um, you know, I think sort of pinning down exactly the right way we want to think about agents updating models versus the state um, would be, um, you know, would be sort of crucial to putting a little bit more, um, making sure we sort of could look at that within a tractable setting. Um, but yeah, I don't know if Daniel has anything he wants yeah, to add. Can I talk? Um, um, yeah. a, third, a third thing we can do, which is, um, which isn't quite, which isn't about updating models really, but we can just allow we could have more than one agent act in the same period and then have the designer reveal information about the number who chose um, to drink or not in the previous period or something like that. Yeah. And that's, I, I think I have that worked out somewhere, but that's relatively similar to sort of our revealing actions. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. um, since we reached a quarter past, uh, uh, we are going to continue conversation afterwards, but the official part is over. We are going to stop recording now. Uh, Aisley, thank you very much uh, for giving a, an excellent talk and our panelists and Daniel for, for attending and all attendees as well. Uh, just to remind you, next week we have our last uh, seminar before the, um, before the break. Uh, thank you very much. And if you, to the attendees, if you want to, um, be part conversation, please let us know. We'll unmute you and, and we can, can just keep, keep chatting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Francesco, you, you wanted to? Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask,